going on guys? Welcome back to a brand new video. I got a special one for you. It's a story time with freaking boys. Episode number 12, brand new season. Love the September. We got Gary <laughs> for fun friends, snow friends. Going on, Gary? Not much, man. Thanks for paying my plane ticket down, too. That was, you didn't have to do that, but I appreciate that. Hey, I do it for the people, man. I do it for the people. I was good. It was either go to Hades or take that plane ticket and, and come down and fly down and see you. You know? How, how do you like Rochester? Have you heard any rumors about The Rock? No. <laughs> uh, and Pasty Boy is going to cook me some steak when I'm, when I'm done, so we're all good. <laughs> He's apparently he's right around the corner. Is that true? Yeah, not far. Yeah, right on. Hey, you look like you're thirsty. You want? Do you want a beer? I'll take one. Here, uh, here, right there. Whoa, oh, I dropped it. Sorry, man. Here. Oh, great! You got it. Perfect. Bye, cup. Great. Have you had one of the ballista beers? Right, straight from Canada, too, brother. My, this one's probably gonna foam up. It got hit by that. What do you think of that, buddy? I needed that. I needed that. There we go. It's all fancy. Yeah. So how's your summer been? What have you been up to? So, you know, I had the graduation party, the wedding. Um, it took a minute to get going. Didn't do a lot of content. Uh, doing a lot of family stuff. <laughs> I tried to do some kayak and stuff, and it, and Gary, to be honest with you, I'll let you. I'll tell you what I was. My big plan for the summer was, and it fell through. So I got a side by side on order. Ooh. And I'm sure you've heard about the ransomware. Yeah. So it's just been a catastrophe since. I, in, in my last video, I did an update and I was like, hey guys, I got a surprise. I'm not going to tell you what it is, just in case it fall throughs. I should have knocked on wood because yeah. it fell through. Oh. Um, this will be on July 31st. Went down there August 8th or 9th after they did that Salt Lake City thing and found out about the ransomware. And I just found out that it'll be in September to December now. So. Wow. So it's a can am, is it? Yeah, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I won't go too much more into it, but, you know, my dad was talking about getting one, and I wanted one, so I, I got rid of everything. I got rid of my Volkswagen, my, uh... I seen that. You, you sold that. You sold it. Yeah, I seen you sold everything off, man. That's that's crazy. Yep. Yeah. The, uh, not, you know, not patience game. Yeah, you know what? Still take it. Can-Am makes a great product, and... Yeah, I, I think it's about as close as you can get the snowmobile experience in a side-by-side -side from just talking to the Michigan outlaws and guys like that, right? Yeah. ATV doesn't do it for me. Like the four-wheel sit-on-by-yourself kind of thing. But I think if I had a buddy beside me, either me driving or the buddy driving and scaring the pants off of each other, I think that would be part of the fun. Yeah, yeah. So we use them like golf carts at our camp and stuff, and then we have a few trails we go on, and we do the loop, you know, the the bar loops and stuff. So they're, they're a good time. And my dad, he likes to do the yard work and stuff. So we got a little bit for everybody coming with this thing. That's pretty awesome. I can't wait for you to get it. I'll probably watch some of your videos then. <laughs> <laughs> I might watch them too. <laughs> Anyway, this isn't my show, it's your show, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice! And I love the shirt you're wearing, that's that's pretty awesome. You got you got one of my... Well, I, I, out of five, I'll give it a four and a half. The beer? Nice! Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. I, 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 like a, I like a Barmy Blonde. Nice, we all like Barmy Blondes. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Gary's all the way in from Fanny's Canada. Fanny Ambassador right here. That's what I love about you, man. And we're, we'll talk about that more as we get going on here, but we, I've got a soft spot for slow, soft spot for slow B because of the, the whole Fanny's connection. <laughs> so I got a, I got a 
got a handful of questions for you. Some of them are, are tug health based, but I'm going to switch them for for you. Yep. If, if you will. Um, and what, we're going to start right off. We're, we're going at this at the snowmobile angle. So can you tell me what your favorite thing to do, what your favorite hobby is outside of snowmobiling? Um, I've got a lot of hobbies outside of snowmobiling, but I like dual sport riding, like the enduro racing. If you've been on the channel, Mud Brats, Snow Brats, there's a few races that I post. I do one a year that's a vintage, so it's it's old guys on old motorcycles. Mine's a 1989 uh, Yamaha DT200R. I do I love doing that, and I'd like to get more into that, but it's it's time more than anything else. And getting the right bike. I mean, I like racing the old ones, but when you're in the in the bush, just casually riding, they're not very fun to ride. So, um, uh, other hobbies. Uh, YouTube's a hobby, is it? Is it not? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. YouTube's a hobby. Three um, D printing. I love three D printing. That's that's something I got into uh, a couple years ago, and it's it's kind of addictive. And I've got a couple products that I sell. Um, online, Super Clip being one of them, and uh, and I 3D print all kinds of junk. Um, ATVing a bit, but not so much. But cottaging overall and boating is, I'd say, is uh, the, it kind of rounds out my hobbies. So you post a lot. I've seen you fishing before. You're, you're, you have a camp that's on a lake. Mm -hmm. We uh, we share uh, 45 acres with. 14 other cottagers, I guess you could say, and we own uh, 200 feet of lakefront. So I've got a couple boats down there. I've got a 17 foot bow rider and I've got a 12 foot aluminum with a 9.9 .9 that we love. And, and the bis, the, <laughs> the bis, the lake is full of largemouth bass and they're decent size. Like we're talking, it's not a, not a problem to catch six pound, five, six pound largemouth every time you go out and I mean we go out for an hour you know we're not we're not sitting there all day so it's uh, if you follow me on Instagram mud brats snow brats you'll see pictures um, drone is another hobby so you see my drone footage when I'm out on the lake uh, as well so yeah it's a, and I didn't really catch any fish until I put the slow V sticker on the back of my fishing seat and now I catch everything it works that's what I was getting at, that sticker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> link in the description, right? Is it, it's a link in the description to get your stickers? Put it there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how many years have you been snowmobiling for? About 40 years, actually. You kind of you led me to that question, and I've seen other guests you've had on, and I was thinking, when was it I started snowmobiling? But I was probably around 10, 12 years old. When I started snowmobiling, my brother, he picked up an old beat up 72 Moto Ski Capri and with a 399 single cylinder. And if I could start it, I could ride it. And I mean, there was no compression release on that thing. And it was a, it was a one longer single thumper. And it was a tough, tough uh, biatch to start, but you got on it and man, you had fun. I think anybody who's had them old ones, you get, what do you got to spray the, the starter fluid in a muffler, hold the thing all the way wide open, and rip it 25 yeah. times. Yeah, there's a there's a story to that, but it's not one of my favorite stories, but if you've got time, this thing here was, you had to spray gas in the carb, and the carb was open, there was nothing else around it, and the, the throttle cable would stick. So basically the, the procedure was, you go out, you jack up the back end, you'd spray gas in the carb, you'd start it, and you, it had no recoil. So you, you wrap the rope around the, the flywheel, it had a little uh, cutout, and you wrap the rope around, you go, doo -doo -doo -doo, and then if you got it the right wind blow in the right direction, your foot upright and your tongue to the right side, it would fire up, and you just let it idle, and you go in the house, and you get. Uh, WD-40 to spray on the throttle linkages and, the, and down the throttle cable because it would always stick. So I started it the one day and my older brother thought it would be kind of funny if he went out and hopped on it and took off on it while I was in the house. So he hops on it. We grew up on a big cliff. Like it's hundreds of feet down to this river and it's fairly straight. And 
He hops on and goes in the backyard and pins it and the throttle sticks wide open and doesn't he bail and this sled goes hurling over the cliff. I had, I had run out when I heard him leave and I come around the corner and I see this thing launching over the cliff and he's jumping off right at the edge. So we had to get his, his work at a big lifted Ford uh, F-250 or whatever, 4x4 pickup and we actually got a huge rope and dragged it back up the hill. The windshield was smashed on it. And, but it ran after that. We rode it and laughed and had fun for another year or two um, before we upgraded that, that sucker. But yeah, that's a good memory of my childhood there. I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's what happens with a couple Barbie blondes. <laughs> that's what it's all about, though. Yeah. So you... you um talk about his snowmobile and you jump on it or whatever. Would you remember what your first one was? That was... You could call your that was, same one? Yeah, it was, so it was our next one after that. He bought uh, a 1985 Motoski uh, Mirage 3. It's a 377. And then he rode it for a couple of years and then he decided to get out of it. And like, so he let me ride it all the time. But I was still riding the old Motoski at that time and he he would let me ride it but then he finally sold it to me and to be honest i don't think i ever paid him full for it if he if he watches his video because he does um i'm sorry i probably still owe you i think he sold it to me for 1200 i i probably still owe him 1150 dollars i don't know <laughs> <laughs> nothing a blarmy blonde can't take care no of that, i'll give him a six pack and that'll that'll even it out but yeah, that Moto Ski Mirage was fun. I mean, I rode that for years and we went on trips to Bancroft and we put some big miles on it. My friends had the Safari, which was the same sled with a different hood. I think the Mirage was a little cooler looking, but the uh, we would go far on it and ride the hell out of them and they were, they were a blast. And they all did the same top speed. Like, you'd hold them in the bar and we'd all be doing 60 miles an hour, not a mile less or a mile more so it was it was fun because you could just pin these things and go crazy yeah the uh i used to ride a i don't know the year of it but it went back and it was the same way you got to that one speed and in this backyard here and i just as a young kid would be flying back and forth and zipping tunes <laughs> <laughs> if you i think everybody needs to ride a bogey machine like Point blank, I don't care, young or old, Drew rode my old 69 Nordic that I bought a couple years ago, and it's an experience, right? To ride something yeah. with bogeys, not sliders, and leaf spring front suspension. I mean, everybody has to ride that in their lifetime. And if you, you haven't made this year, put it on your bucket list, because it's an experience and it's fun. Ain't <laughs> that true? Yeah. So, so how often do you, what are you writing now and then how often do you upgrade and why do you upgrade when you do? Well, I, I usually upgrade and not because I, I want a better machine, it's just because they mile out. So up until last year, last year was my first ever brand new snowmobile and it's a 2022 Renegade 850 X package. And I love that machine. Uh, I went full bore on it. The tunnel adjusters, uh, the the Pilot TX skis had the 7.8 inch dash uh, with the BRP Go on it. I was spoiled rotten on that thing. That's the very first sled, new sled I ever got. Uh, prior to that, it was just basically ride them, and when they get high miled out and you're sick of fixing them, you'd flip it flip it out. So. The only reason I went with a new sled is because I, I wanted to get into the Gen 4 and you know I was looking around and now with COVID pricing and everything and John Luke at Energy Power Sports he showed me several used units which were really good and, and good value uh, from a dealer side but at the end of the day I went you know what I you might as well buy new and then the 2023 Gen 5 came out and I had to have it. <laughs> so I actually have spring ordered a, a Gen 5 
and this is after I just say I don't upgrade or don't get new. So I do have a spring order Gen 5 XRS with smart shocks and the 10 and a quarter inch gauge on order. And the gauge is what really sold me on it. It's uh, when I seen that at the, at the, uh, the BRP tour, I just had to have it, you know? So it's, uh, that's really what sold me on it. Dirty man, it's dirty. <laughs> But saying that, you know, like my, my plan with the 2022 was never really to keep it. Uh, I wanted to take advantage of the COVID resale pricing and it was, it was going to be a short term relationship with that sled. As much as I love it, I just, you know, money wise, it's not something I could keep. I mean, it'll, uh, it'll get traded in at good value or sold privately. A good value and I'll uh, I won't lose that much and I consider that as a rental fee basically for a year you know what I mean if I if I lose if I lose let's say three to five thousand I can't buy a used sled for that in a year you know what I mean like there's junk out there for five grand Canadian I mean I I'm sure that the American prices are the same are they uh, I'm not in that deep <laughs> no no well, that's the thing. I, I I don't know if you know. Like I was expecting a question of of, of how we met or first met, and I I translate that to how when we first found each other's YouTube channel. And I think that the first time I found your channel, you had that you had just bought your sled, and it was brand new, right? And and I and you had it stored in that barn, and I'm thinking. Oh, that poor sled, you know, like, <laughs> who is this guy? He must be a rich YouTuber to have a sled like that. I wish, I wish. I know, and then you're, you get the reality of all oh, this YouTube thing's just a, you, you, we might as well not do YouTube and just, just mail money to random people throughout the year. <laughs> wanted to pigeonhole myself in the one in the one uh, subject right yeah so so the whole idea of my channel was everything I do is pretty much outdoors well over time in, in the writing that we've done in Tug Hill and stuff a lot of people just jumped on the soul feeling stuff so now all my hits are in winter and then the summer so I, so at the end of the day I ended up getting pigeonholed in the snow feeling but there, there's still some other other views and whatnot but hey yeah, it's just fun to do, right? It is, and and I think YouTube will actually force you into that pigeonhole. Um, no matter what yep. other content you put on there, you just won't get traction on it. And you hear the same from you hear the same from Rev Rider, and you hear the same from Pasty Boy. Um, no matter what you put out in the summertime, because you're so in that that cube of snowmobiling, it just doesn't get any traction. So. Um, that's why a lot of these guys take the summer off and then they come back in the fall and they they start producing again but it's such a small it's such a small world like market that it's and i think canadians have a harder time getting known mark bow is another youtuber that that uh, has been working really hard to kind of get a channel built up and and he hasn't hit that 1000 subscriber threshold yet and uh, he's done everything he can to to do it and and it's and then you look at some other YouTubers from the U.S. that and again your market's ten times our size, right? So, but they seem to grow a lot faster than we can ever get get you know known out there for. And I think the other thing is too when you when you become a face of and I and I like to put myself in this circle is is our actual our whole group we, we're kind of becoming like the face of different elements of snowmobiling and, and it's hard when, when you have a group of guys we're, we built a little family especially from your podcast and stuff yeah where it's hard to break it's hard to break that ice to that thousand i, mean, I, I want to say when i started and, and i don't i think it might have been four years ago there weren't a lot of snowmobiler youtubers and within a matter of like a year and six months if that People just started coming out of the woodworks with with their channels and stuff, and 
And once you get that, once you get that many people coming out, it's hard to break the ice. Yeah. Oh, for sure. That that's the thing. It's like I I can't I can't recall when I started, uh, but it you know like and someone had said like basically like. You you got the the Rev Riders and and myself and Pasty Boy Pasty Boy is kind of like a pioneer really and right. and Rev Rider and somebody called me that like put me in that group at one point but I wouldn't say that I think I think I was watching these guys when you know when I was I was just putting videos out for just my own personal my own personal enjoyment right like something that i can create a, an archive to look at down the road um my, my father had parkinson's so he he ended up having alzheimer's and i mean that's something that i think he would have enjoyed watching his hijinks through the years of working on old trucks and you know doing what he did you know doing buggies and everything like he probably would have enjoyed that even though in his last stage he probably didn't know who it would be but it would be kind of funny so um, my uncle did it with his piano he, used, he recorded on cassette tapes piano for years so i'm just carrying on that tradition and it, the fact that other people want to watch it really blows me away you know in the comments and the same, yeah and and the, like, are, that's holy shit. <laughs> yeah and you get you, some days uh, you probably feel this way. Some days you feel like quitting, and then you get a comment saying, "You know, keep it up, and that was great, and I really enjoyed that, or whatever it is." And it, you go, "Okay, that's worth it then," because it is a lot of work, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. I started on that premise too, like, and a lot of my followers know if it doesn't go anywhere, we we have a lifetime library in YouTube. For people after well after work on to still go view these videos whether it's our family friends or our, our grandkids down the road so that, that's what's great about youtube is exactly and i mean everybody <laughs> library <laughs> exactly you know and it, you, you gotta think when you go on youtube and you you open it up and how many videos are out there and added daily and it's like to be found in the mix of it all is, is pretty amazing, right? Yeah. So, and you mentioned the podcast, and that's like been a, that's been a huge joy for me. Like that's, that's become a hobby and a, and a real passion. And the fact that people, and again, it's a small community, but people like yourself and every week you go on and it's the same group of guys that are chit chatting and, and just having fun and, and if, you, if, if your viewers aren't watching Snowmobile Sessions on YouTube, they should, and they should join in the live chat because it's a riot. And, the, right. uh, um, and, and it's so funny. And I mean, you hear stories. Your story is the best where you live around the corner from Pasty Boy and didn't even know it until you got chatting in the live chat on, on the podcast. Yeah, it's... It's, it's just... It wouldn't be yeah, and I hear I hear stories like that all the time, and I think it's created friendships. Uh, Corey Brock and I, um, we became really good friends through I don't know whether it was through YouTube, but it's certainly after the podcast started. Um, and he's a really good supporter of it, um, and uh, and helps me out as whenever he can. I mean, he's always throwing super chats in there and stuff, but he's always been a huge supporter of it, and he's there every week. Um, a lot of people. It's uh, it's really neat. And well, I, it's tough. I think you'll agree. A lot of these guys, they, they like buy into what you're doing and how you're doing it. And, you know, some of them they want to ride with you or they want to hang out. They want to get a beer. And, and coming from my angle, I, I hope some of them understand. You really, you really need to like meet this person three or four times before you're like, yeah, let's go for a ride or let's get a beer. You yeah. really gotta. You can't just jump on a sled with somebody that you met the night before in a podcast and yeah. everything go well, you know? <laughs> that's that's <laughs> very true. That's very I, true. I, some I, of these guys, they, they're like, oh, he's blowing me up. It's not that I blow him up. It's that I really need to figure out if you're the guy I want next to me on a trail, 
Because I, at the end of the day, I don't want to go home and guy down because the guy I said, yeah, let's go moon boot it right into a tree. Yeah. And you know, in, in reality is you, you get asked all the time and, and the, the winter's short. You only have a few right. weeks. You only have a few weeks, and it's really hard to to cram it all in, right? So, and, and as you can, I get asked to go on trips all the time, and what one is cash flow to go on some of the bigger trips is kind of tough. But but right. it, it, and time is the other. Time is the big thing. Um, there's just not enough time. We get we get six weeks maybe of really solid riding if we're lucky. And uh, you want to spend that with the guys that, that you enjoy riding with the most. So, uh, like you said, to bring in new people, it's pretty tough. So, but saying that, you know, that we're going to take another kick at the can for the, the Snowmobile Sessions group ride this year. And it's going to be in Sudbury. We're going to guarantee to have snow. And uh, more details will be on the first episode of Snowmobile Sessions. What's that? I said, that's a pretty big guarantee. <laughs> you, know, you know what? Where we were going to go last year to the beer spot, it was raining and there was no snow. And that same weekend, we drove Yeah, we drove another couple hours north and it was heaven. We were riding a blizzard. So it, uh, it's pretty much, you, your odds are a lot better. So saying that, I, I do have an announcement because Snowmobile Sessions live streaming podcast has always been about the community of sledders getting together week to week, right? And what I'm going to do this year is I'm going to bring, I'm going to blow the roof off of this thing and I'm going to bring in a different snowmobiler co-host with me every week. So, yeah, so we'll have the, we'll have the, the great guests on. You know the, the 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 companies, the vendors, the superstars, and then I'll I'll just have people email me, and if you want to be a co-host, if you think you'd be good on screen and and uh, help me interview these people, then we'll bring them on, and and that'll help put the face to the name. Like Tony Cat, for example, is a is a great example. He's very active in the chat, but maybe a lot of people don't know who he is or what he looks like, and and it'll bring that personality in. I'd, I'd like to see you on it. I'd like to see Greg uh, uh, sometime is now on it. Um, I think for, if I can do another 30 episodes over winter, I can easily find 30 guys to do it. The, the last episode of Snowmobile Sessions is what got me thinking about it. Um, when I had all you guys on screen and we just sat there and shot the breeze and and uh, had a blast. And, and I went, after that, after that show ended and I woke up the next day, I went, that was really fun. You know, like it was just us guys being what we are like. And it was like, like I say that snowmobile sessions is like hanging out in your shop and all your buddies, all your buddies showing up for a beer. And that's, that's what it is week to week. But now let's take it to that next level and, and open it up and I'll let you guys be the co hosts What do you think of that idea? And let's face it, if you're having fun, your viewers are having fun. Yeah. And, and it's that's fun. Yeah, and it's gotta be different every every year, right? We gotta bring something new to the table. So this is it. So stay tuned for more information on that. I I'll uh, I'll be sending that out but October third, Monday, October third, seven PM Eastern Standard Time on my my YouTube channel, Mud Brats, Snow Brats and I'll post a link in the comments, and we can we can get this thing rolling. Yeah, and I'll have all Gary's stuff in my description below. All his social media, his uh, snowmobile sessions, the date it starts. We'll do all that stuff for him. Um, let's 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 move on to the next question. Sure. Well, what's your what are your favorite mods to do? I'm not a real big mod guy, but first and foremost is is I stud the track so. Fast Track Studs, great product, USA, made in the USA, family business, and uh, Fast Track Studs on the track right away. I don't like the Ice Ripper tracks. I'd rather go traditional studs. Not really a mod, but it's a must do. Um, the other thing is the uh, uh, clutching. So I didn't clutch my 850 because I wanted to get 
a year under the belt of it. Um, but any other sleds I've owned, I've always clutched them. And it gives you better performance, but it also increases the belt life, hands down. Right. So um, that's pretty much it. We did an airbox mod on the on Roscoe and one of the other sleds I used to own. I wouldn't say that's a huge benefit, but um, you know, I'm not. I'd rather have reliability. Anything over the top of that, I'd rather have reliability over over performance. You know, performance. Yeah, performance is important, but reliability is more important than her. <laughs> so, I know the answer to this. I think you might be able to be more specific, though, for, for my viewers and for the one for your viewers that are watching. What is your, uh, what's the primary area that you ride? It's a, well, I know it's camp, right? But I don't know, like, the... Yeah. I just know you say Muskoka or like the different areas like that. Yeah, Muskoka is the primary area. There's a lot of guys that ride way more than I do. I mean, and go further and that kind of thing. But I have a cottage in Muskoka. So Muskoka is a, is a big cottage area. Uh, the town is actually Huntsville, Ontario. And it's about, uh, it's about three hours, three and a half hours from the border, I'd say, from if you were crossing in Niagara Falls, New York. Um, you're probably three to four hours north of that, um, just to give you an idea of, of where we we're at. Um, good snow every year and uh, lots of great variety of riding. And um, it's, uh, there's, there's always something new to see and, and really where we are situated, you can go wherever you want. I mean, you can see that, that some of the trails we cover the same year to year but a lot of times we're finding new, still today, we're finding new areas to ride, which is really cool from your back door, basically. So, so is your snow, is your snow predictable? Like, and I mean like every year, I keep a lot of, like every weekend I go to camp, I write down what the weather was like, what we did that weekend, what cars we went to, what loop we did, how much snow there was. And if you go back, there's a general like, story you can pick up like i'll see guys say oh we haven't got snow yet but then this is like super bowl weekend right and i can look back at the log and say you're not going to get good snow until like the middle of january um but we rode in north bay we, we rode there two years in a row and i don't think north bay got more than 12 inches of snow but it was so cold and so well groomed and taken care of that it didn't matter that it was 12 inches of snow. It's so where when you get on the hill here, you get 12 inches of snow and they don't stay on top of it. Over time, you got mashed potatoes and granular powder and stuff, and it just makes for a, a different week, different type of weekend. So I guess that's what I mean. Like you're where you ride, can you say, oh, January 1st, we'll probably have that ride of snow? Yeah, to some degree. Last year was a really weird year. Like. It yeah, was, it was here too. yeah, yeah. So it was flipped so that we had snow at home here, which is you know two and a half hours south of of Muskoka, and up north we didn't have snow till third week of February, I think it was, and it wasn't that great. But usually you could say if you're going to say I'm going up to the cottage, we're going to we're going to put money on it. That last weekend in January is probably you know the trails are going to be open and they're going to be running good. Um, if you get in there before that, middle of January, like the 15th, you know, kind of time frame, it's a bonus. But usually that third or last weekend in January is the best, you know, around. Uh, at home here, I've been riding as early as end of November, uh, 1st of December, but then it melts. You know, you're out drift basking, bashing in the field, but then it's gone. So, um, yeah. Yeah, like yeah, it it's somewhat it usually is predictable, and then it goes right into March break, uh, middle of March, and that's probably your last time riding in Muskoka. And or you can go up to Cochrane, which is you know nine hours, let's say eight, eight nine hours uh, north, and you can be riding into April, and you can be starting in end of December. So um, it 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 does vary year to year, but Cochrane will guarantee have snow no matter what it always snows there and it snows a lot um i've never been 
but uh, that might be something I tap off the, the list this year, who knows? Uh, it's, it's still early yet. But, you know, around here, if we're lucky, at home, we've ridden New Year's Eve before on OFSC trails that were groomed, open, and fairly decent. So um, that's a big bonus. It's all you can hope for. I don't think my pockets could afford December to April. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here and I'm about to season, I think, well, can you, can you afford to go? Two more months, you know? Oh, I can't imagine, man, especially fuel prices the way it is. I listened to the last podcast and we're that that's right when the fuel was starting to climb up and we actually say some of the prices and I think it was regular gas was going up to like a buck thirty and we were freaking out and now it's like a buck eighty. So, you know, I think it's down to one forty seven now. But it really hey there's my dog. It really got um got uh, crazy there for a bit and I think we still haven't seen the end of it yet yet by the way I didn't appreciate having to pay for a plane ticket for your dog too yeah no problem I, I brought her in carry-on believe it or not you know so <laughs> this is kind of a loaded question um, everybody kind of has the same answer but I I like to still ask it because I think it's an important question for the people that are following us and the people that are trying to get into snowmobiling, what is your favorite part part about snowmobiling? I think it's the I think it's the rush. It's it's a different feeling. There's nothing. There's no other sport. And I don't care what you're talking about. There's no other sport that de delivers the feeling of snowmobiling. There's it's adrenaline. It's hanging out with your buddies. It's it's gliding through the snow, it's changing, Not no two days are the same. You go out on your crotch rocket street bike, that street's the same today as it is tomorrow, as it is the next day. I can leave in the morning on my snowmobile and in the afternoon that trail is a different trail. Um, it's in New York. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know what, and that's, that's the, uh, that's a neat thing about it. And, and the camaraderie is, is really cool and you're out in the, fresh air and the cold and I mean it's it's hard to describe but if any I, I can't see anybody watching this that isn't a snowmobiler but if you're watching this because you're a kayaker and you've never snowmobiled get your butt on a snowmobile because it's a different feeling ATVing doesn't cut it I got out of snowmobile and I bought a couple ATVs for me and my son we lost interest real fast in it you have to wash them after every ride it, you know and they just ended up sitting. We bought an old beater sled, the Grinch, uh, and a 96 fan 380. We double rode on it for a bit. And before that, I, before long, I bought a beater 670 Formula SS, and the rest was history. I just kept flipping sleds and buying sleds and flipping them and, and getting newer and newer and newer, and, and here we are today. So. Um, right in the 50s, baby. Yeah, and it's addictive, right? Like, the, it, when you hammer the throttle on an 850, it's addictive. It's There's a rush there, and it straightens your arms, and you just... <laughs> you, it, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit like, like motocross, like a dirt bike, but it's more smooth, and if you fall off, you don't get, you don't get hurt as much, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so we established your primary area what's your favorite loop like do you have a favorite loop that you just can't wait to get your skis on and rip it yeah like there, actually you know there's a loop up north called the and you'll see videos on my channel called Bonfield to Mattawa to North Bay and that's probably the it's a big loop like you're probably going to be you're gonna probably be hitting that. My dog just farted. Uh, you're probably gonna be hitting two to three hundred kilometers, and there's all there's. I think there's fourteen sites to see along it. There's a, a an old mica mine that you can walk into. That's uh, that's really cool. There's all these lookouts. There's and the lookouts all have stories. So there's all these Native American stories that that talk about you know folklore and the devil and all this stuff and 
and it's it's really cool and and you just you ride along this this loop and it's uh, it's probably one of my favorite I haven't been there in uh, we didn't get there last year I think the year before we were up but it's definitely something I want to do this year do you do you have I couldn't tell you loops I've done when I was there but I just remember, this is a quick story for you. I might have already told it to you on your on snowmobiling sessions, but man, that one day, we, we rode into Quebec from North Bay, and when we got to that main power line that takes you into Quebec, and you go through the blue tunnel, yeah, that that's a long rip, and it was moguls the whole entire way. So so we did something close to like 200 and like 20 miles, maybe. Yeah. So, so the next day, we woke up and we're ready to ride and we're like, hey, who cares, right? We're not going riding. That's how we ended up over at Fanny's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, well, and you like know, so, so you went, so the top, there's a, there's a, if you look on the map, there's a, there's a park called Algonquin Park and it's a huge, basically a state park. Uh, it's a provincial park, but it's all protected. You can't snowmobile through it. You snowmobile around it. And the, the Mattawa Loop is the top of the park, so it runs along the top. That's probably the best trails anywhere because they're long, they're fast, they're flowy, they're, they're lots of snow. But if you go further, you end up on kind of like a rail line. There's a lot of slag and I don't know whether it's an old fire road or a rail line, but it's, it gets nasty and that's probably where you've seen the moguls and everything um, along there. Are you familiar with the portage? Yeah, yeah. So, so every night we would, on our way back in, we'd stop at the portage and drink. Right on. And I think this this story coming from a, a Tug Hiller, maybe, or, or even just not a non Canadian. Um, at the time, we were two, two twins and they were gorgeous, right? We're in there for hours. And it started to get dark out the one night. And they, they both walked up to us and they're like, you guys got to go. We're like, no, we're, we're having a good time. We don't have to go. They're like, no, we're cutting you off. You got to get out of here. And, and our reply is, you don't understand us. You don't have to cut us off. And she goes, both of them are like, it's not about that. It's dark out. It's going to get cold. You got to get out of here. You can't be riding after dark in, in this area. Yeah. It just, and it ended up being like 45 below Fahrenheit that night. Wow. Yeah, it gets, yeah. it gets cool. That's the thing. Um, do you ride with muffs, like the things that go over your handlebars? At the time, we didn't have those. Yeah, well, that's the thing. We were up at that time. Yeah, if you, if you use those, it's they help a lot. Like they, that, uh, getting cold ruins a ride fast. So, um, yeah, it's uh, use muffs up there for sure. I just, I just bought a pair of this. Um, this summer, I bought a pair of moss and on those rock hand guards. Nice, they help too. Yeah. 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 So, so establish your loop. Favorite food destination and why? What do they got that you have to have? I I I love I'm a burger guy, so I love anybody that has a decent burger. So there's there's quite a few places, as you know, that you can go. My favorite food destination is probably the Red Canoe in Kearney. And the only reason is, is because we can leave from our door. Uh, actually, there, there, there's two. So I'll, I'll finish this one. You can leave from my cottage door and go to the Red Canoe. And, uh, and then there's the ice caves and things like that that you can see there. And the Red Canoe is a hangout. Like you, go to the, you go to the parking lot and it's, it's like a snowmobile show. There's hundreds of sleds in it at any given point in time. So that's... That's probably a, a, a definite do every year. Even if we don't go to the ice caves, we'll go to the Red Canoe, eat, and ride home. Um, and it runs along the Oxtongue River and everything like that. And the other destination is Durham. Um, the, uh, the Durham Golf and Ski is another one. And, and that's, uh, you can ride from my door at home and, uh, and head up there. We did 407 kilometers, which is, what, 300 miles, 290 or whatever, 300 miles last year from our back door went to the went to Durham they have, they have arguably one of the better bur best burgers on a snowmobile route 
and then we rode home. So um, those are two of my favorite spots for sure, and local too. So you, so you talked about the Muskoka Trailhead and the like 14. Your favorite loop or whatever had 14 destination spots. Yeah. Do you have a favorite historical site? The, uh, a favorite trail site um, attraction? You know, the, the yeah. last. last like. Yeah, well, not so much historical. There's a couple places. One historical would be the Dorset, the Dorset Fire Tower. Uh, that, that's something we always go to every year. I flew the drone around it last year, and uh, you used to be able to climb up it, and I think they're going to let you back up it this year, uh, this coming winter. But uh, it's an old fire tower, and it overlooks the world. Um, I think I can see your house from there, actually. The, um, and then this, the other thing that just became my favorite is the world's longest snowmobile bridge, which is over the French River. Um, and it's, you can fit 100 snowmobiles end to end over this thing. And I want to say it's 90 feet above the water. And this thing's a massive suspension bridge. And uh, it is a sight to see. Like, to think that the, that the Federation of Snowmobile Clubs built this thing for the sole purpose of snowmobiling it blows my mind. I like stuff like that. I, uh, I Sometimes we ride too fast and we miss the good stuff, you know? Yeah. Oh, for sure. And that's one thing I learned about riding with my wife last year. And I think I've told this on the podcast before, is there's, there's one spot we come out of this trail and it's kind of whoop de doos and we fly through it. And last year I was doing the, the 50 kilometer an hour run with my wife and there's an old vintage snowmobile hanging from the tree. And I'm like, I just stop and get pictures because I've never seen this thing before, but it, it could have been hanging there for 50 years. You don't know, it's all rusted. So then I, took, I told my son about it. He didn't believe me. And then I drove him out there the one night and we took pictures of it. And he goes, we've been by this thing a hundred times, if not 200 times, and never noticed it. Because you're going too fast, right? So this next question is off the cuff. I'm putting you on the spot. Why are you so hard on us Tug Hill guys? <laughs> I'm not hard on the Tug Hill guys. Actually, I want to ride Tug Hill. I uh, the, the whole joke is the way that the Tug Hill was named. You know, and uh, you know, you'll have to watch the podcast to see the history of Tug Hill and how it was named. But um, Tug Hill sounds like an awesome place. I, I'm, it's more of a tongue-in-cheek joke. I'm not making fun of of the people of Tug Hill. It's it was just one of those off-the-cuff uh, stories that came out, and the uh, and it just kind of stuck with a sound effect to boot. So um, Tug Hill sounds like a Bancroft area that we have up here where you get mecca snow and you can always get good conditions where everyone else is kind of hurting. You, you got to you gotta know who to ride with and the, where to go because it does, you're right, it gets busy, it gets wild, it, and if you don't go with the right person your first time, it, you might have the worst time in your life. If you go with the right person, it, a group like mine, and I'm not, you know, I'll pat my group on the back, we have a great trail leader, and they'll say, oh, Valentine's weekend, we're going this direction because everybody that comes up is going this direction. And he, I'll tell you what, 98% of the time, man, he nails it right on the head. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. Tug Hill is going to make me a bronze statue, apparently, in the village square. So I, I think the Tug Hillians, is that what they call them? Tug Hillians or Tug Hillers? They love me. So... We'll see. I haven't had anyone. I haven't had anyone mad about the whole Tug Hill history. Um, you know, if anyone, if anything, people like Greg sometimes now love it. <laughs> it's it's the ever changing vistas of Mary Lake of the U.S. I'm telling no, you. I love the, I love the joke. I was like, I got I got to put him on the spot. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, Gary, I mean, a hundred. If I'm hundred percent honest with you. And I think a lot of my, my subs know too. I run south. I, I, I run out of Redfield and I run south. I watch I'll watch the weather and be like, all right, they got 
they got enough snow. I very rarely do the, I call it going around the horn, where we go straight up the hill and then go through the gorge and come back into right field. I, I'll do that once a year, and I make sure it's in the middle of the week. It's not around the weekend. Right, right. Oh, that's like us too. Like it gets busy, right? Um, yeah, you, no. you have to go. You have to go on weekdays if you can. If you go on weekdays, you have to be prepared to be riding in the in the crowds, right? What is like you've ridden Canada and U.S. So albeit Canada, the Ontario trails, you kind of limited experience. But what are your thoughts and comparatively, how do they compare in your mind? I want to say the picture hanging on the wall in my house is 2006. So I. I want to say I went there two years in a row, and I'm telling you the time frame so you understand where I'm coming from in case it's different now. I want to say it's between 2006 and 2008. Our group went four, four times or so, and I only did two times. We have an expressway out here called 390, and only a handful of my viewers will understand that. Um, but if you're running the main express, expressway, it's two to three lanes wide. Um, those are not our trails here in New York. So, right. so anytime I rode in, the, in North Bay, you can jockey for position with your buddies. Like I remember riding for a week and counting only like 20 sleds that whole week. Yeah. But it, there's times where the, the very first time we were out, we did the 220, I think it was. And for about a hundred of that, I couldn't see the guy behind me and I couldn't see the guy in front of me. And we stopped at every intersection to make sure we don't lose each other. There were no intersections, so we're, you're running for a while like, wow, did, some, did they go into a vortex we don't know about? So I call them 390 wide or expressway wide or I don't know what they call them out in Quebec or, or in your area, but when you got the three lane roads and they're flat as a board, man, that's, that's my experience. My only bad experience was that trip into 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 Quebec from the, the power lines. Yeah. That was just, it was cold, it was moldy, it was just as bad of an experience it was, I wasn't working, right? Well, that's, and that, that's the thing. <laughs> I, I think that where you rode the top of the park there, it is wider and faster and flowier. Um, in, in, when you go a little bit more south, you get a bit more bush trails and, and variety and, and that kind of thing. but. Again, there isn't a lot of stops because you're in crown land and you're in bushes and, and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I, I, I want to, I'd like to ride, I don't know whether it's the tug or, or where I go, but I'd like to try some of the U.S. Wisconsin sounds like it's, a, it's very similar to, to our Ontario riding. And that, that kind of piques my interest as well, Mackinac, um, that type of thing. It, you see all the fan photos being sent in every week and you go, man, I... I'd love to experience that myself, you know, so, right. you know, I'd, I'd like, I just love hearing other people's perspective because, on, you know, when I, when you watch the channels, it seems like a lot of the guys are just riding around in circles. They're riding the same yeah. loop, the same trail where we, I think we're fortunate to have 30, over 30,000 kilometers of connected groom trails. I believe last year there was 28,000 kilometers open at one point. So I don't know what that is miles, but let's say that's 20,000 miles of trails and you're not going to see the same trail twice, you know, in Ontario. So we're pretty fortunate with that. So I, so I think Pumpkill is kind of the same way. Trails are a little closer together. Um, how do I, I want to think about how I want to put this. Myself, I'll say myself, and I'm going to put you into the lump because you have a camp too. Yeah. I think when you start seeing guys who don't have camps riding all the time and doing the same loops, they're going they're going to where they know, and they're doing that same loop over and over because they're 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 not fortunate, right, to have a camp to go to. It's where if it, the old term, if it's snowing, I'm going, right? Yeah. When you leave Rochester and it's snowing bad, everybody's coming back into Rochester, and you got a you got a small group of guys that are jacked up, ready to rock, heading out of Rochester up towards the hill. And uh, I just think that's another reason that happens, where you have 
you see some of the same trails. Yeah. They're not have a camp to go to every weekend. Yeah, and they're, they're just you know. Yeah, they, they go what they where they know and they're comfortable with, right? I mean, you look at the miles, the the uh, and and I'm not I'm not bragging about mileage because I'm not a big miler myself. I mean, it's uh, I, I, I'm probably over planning. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, there's some there's some snowmobilers down south that ride, you know, 700 miles or or 500 miles a season, and they think it's a good season, but up here, that's that could be one weekend, you know. Right. Um, so it's it's like it's all relative. I mean, it, you, you get what you put into it, and you got to ride with the weather, uh, you know, where the weather is, and and that kind of thing. And I think being in Canada, we're fortunate in Ontario too to have the snow. And like I said, it can go for eight weeks. You you can you can have a six to eight week season without a problem on average. So knock on wood, I don't want to jinx myself and have El Nino come in this year and ruin it for everybody. And that, and that mile, you're right, that's all their difference. You asked me that question is, we did like 850 miles in like six days. Yeah. Whereas with seasons, that's all we're getting here, depending on the weather and work and can you get out of town fast enough? Can you snow? Can you go when it's snowing? Because yeah. Basically, a lot of times you're working nine to five, five days a week in the middle of the week, and if you don't have a job, you can't get out. Sometimes you're missing a good storm. Oh, exactly. It's all it's all relative. Our trails opened at home last year during one of the podcasts. My buddy uh, Moose texted me from the groomer, basically saying, "Get your ass out here! It's snowing like crazy, and I'm in the middle of my show, and I'm going like, <laughs> oh, I I would be out there so bad." And by the time we finished, it was like 10, 11 o'clock at night. I went to bed and try and hit it the next day, right? So. <laughs> so that kind of leads into the next question. I don't, I don't know if you bring new people snowmobiling with you or if you got new if, if people ask, like you or your son, can I go, can I try it out? But, but say you did, and, and maybe if this question doesn't pertain to you, you can skip it or whatever, but kind of the day in the life of you as a snowmobiler, like where would, where would you bring a new person? How would you treat them? And if, and, if, and if you're not doing something like that, just give us a basic day in the life of Gary on the snowmobile trail. Um, no, like new people, I love to get involved in the sport. Like my wife used to ride, not all the time, but she enjoyed riding with us when we were younger and first dating and that kind of thing. And she hadn't been on a sled in years, and then she rode locally here uh, on the the Formula 380E, uh, but she didn't like the ditches, and it was plowed fields, and you know, bad experience. She she enjoyed it, but not as much as what my son Drew and I enjoy every week, where we're going north and we're we're in twisties and lots of snow and. There's no road riding and stuff. So last year, I convinced her to come up north and we rode the trails and she had a blast. So I think for new people, it's taking them on, on non-technical trails, good scenery like the sled hanging from the tree and the, the vistas of Mary Lake and that kind of thing. Um, and, and just seeing the sights, even if they're gonna putt slow, you know? so. I think that's important is not to to take them on too wild of a ride or too rough of a ride for the first ride or so to let them get hooked on the sport and then let them decide how far they want to go. It might be, we tried to go to the Dorset Tower with my wife last year and we got about three quarters of the way there and she said, you know what, I think I'm almost done. It, like to go back, it, I'd be done snowmobiling. And I just said, okay, let, we're, we're pretty close to it. And I just said, okay, let's turn around and go home. And the next time we can go, right? Like, I don't want to force her to get there and have her exhausted on the way home trying to get back, being one of her first times out on her own on a sled. So um, that, I think that's really important, you know? And if you have the right people with you, uh, we ran into a group on the trail that stopped and chatted with us and stuff, and we had a few laughs and, and that kind of thing. That all helps 
in the whole experience of it all. Um, aside from that, if the people already snow me, like we talked about earlier, where, hey, snow me, I want to ride with you, and I've been riding since I was 10 years old, and, you know, where can we go? That's, that's something where I try and pack in as much as I can as far as scenery goes. One of the guys from my story with Hans and Franz's motel resort, he actually hit me at Christmas last year to wish me a Merry Christmas, and I haven't talked to him in years, and I really haven't snowmobiled with him since, probably since the Hans and Franz weekend. And you know what? We, he was, I found out we were trying to, he was trying to come to the beer spa, it got canceled. His trip to uh, Sudbury fell through because the guy he was going to room with got COVID. And then basically we lost touch. And at the end of the season, one of our last rides, I said, what are you up to? And he said, I'm going up to Huntsville riding. And his Airbnb he was staying at was like 30K away from our cottage. So it was like, well, let's hook up. So we ended up taking him on a big loop. We seen the Dorset Tower. We seen the Kearney Ice Caves. I said if we seen the the, uh, the shelter in, in Oxton Lake, we would have had the trifecta of it all. But, I mean, we did a big ride. We had a blast. We changed sleds the whole time, and uh, it was great. And, and that's the thing. It's like show them some sights, stop and have some scenery, shoot the shit, bash each other, and, uh, and everybody will have a good time. Yeah. I, I took a couple of uh, my cousin and one of her good friends out one time. I had kind of made the mistake. Um, the, the bar we were going to was only like 22 miles away, so it's going to be 44, 45 mile round trip. It took us hours to get there. And, and I quickly realized when we got back that they just wanted to go into the field in our back of our, the back nine of camp and just rip back and forth and not take that ride, take a ride that long. So, <laughs> Well, that's the thing. You got to, you got to, um, appeal to them, right? Because uh, you, the worst thing you want them to do is, is have a bad time and never want to go again, right? Yep. So, we're coming to that time where it's freaking story time. <clears throat> Wait a minute, don't, don't you ask me if I brought a picture? Is that next? I took that one. Did you, did you bring a picture? I did bring a picture. You took it out. I wasn't sure if you brought one, so we could do, we'll, what, we'll what, do that one. What's your favorite picture? Show us. My favorite picture of snowmobiling? I, 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 I kind of like that one. Do you like that one? I guess. Do you like... Uh, yeah. is, it supposed to be a, is it supposed to be a me snowmobiling? Your favorite snowmobiling <laughs> picture, Gary. This is, this is my favorite one, so... Oh, beautiful. Isn't that cool? So this was a... This was one of those nights where we were we were riding and and uh, again this is Muskoka and it was uh, we had done a really big loop and we, we came back and it was like four o'clock and we were back to the cottage and I this is my buddy from public school we grew up together Mike Cardi we used to snowmobile on those old bogey boxes all the time and uh, basically. We, we pulled up to the intersection where he would go straight, kind of go home, and we'd go right to go, go home. And we pull up and kind of, I think he was expecting us to say goodbye. And I said, it's too early to call it a night. Let's keep going. Let's go south. So we had wrote, wrote a big north loop. And I said, let's go south. So we went south towards Gravenhurst. And when we come back, it was a full moon. And there's this, this section of trail we call a roller coaster, and it's these huge whoop de doos And this moon was rising the whole time we were watching. It's it's on a video, and the whole time we were watching this moon come up, and it you know when it's close to the ground like that, it's massive. And we we're coming through these whoop de doos and I said, "You got to stop at that last one." And uh, and Drew and him pulled up beside each other, and I ran with my iPhone and snapped the shot and. It's uh, it's probably one of the best nights ever. Like it was a, uh, it was a pretty crazy, uh, crazy thing to capture. The moon was so bright; it was like daylight out there. It was really cool. Yeah, that's an awesome picture. That's it makes me think of right away. Like when you're next to each other, you look at each other, and you're like, 
the drive till the fucking sun comes up. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't like that. It was just like the sun was still out, and it was like it was a beautiful day. We should have stayed home, like we should have went home. But it was one of those things where it's like, you know what? Let's keep going. It's it's too early. Like, what are we gonna do? Go home, eat eat a pizza, and then just sit around? And, no, let's keep riding. We've got gas. We've got time, and. Away we go. So I love nights like that. It's just so spontaneous. Yeah. And we went to ride this uh, down to, uh, it's called High Falls. It's a waterfall, so it flows all winter long. So we stopped on the bridge at High Falls, took some pictures. He showed us a little few little secret haunts. He's a, he's a real outdoorsman and knows all the backcountry areas. So he showed us a, a neat little miniature falls and walking bridge that was in the area. And, and away we go. But sadly, he, he got out of snowmobiling a couple of years ago. He had a he had a twelve hundred that burned down, and then he bought a Viper Turbo, and he ended up selling it after a few rides, and just hasn't gotten back into it. So he's a really good rider and, and a great guy. And I I I really felt sad when he said he was selling his machine at the beginning of it. That was at the beginning of the season, and it's like. I got one ride in with them, so, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, and like, like we were saying earlier, you have your core friends, so um, the guy that we bought the, the 50th anniversary sled off of, we try and ride once a year or twice a year. Jeremy Odekirk, he's in the podcast uh, group, we, we, we ride every year, I met him through through Mike, and then, um, you know, now my my old buddy from Hans and Franz days from high school, uh, Grant, we're gonna we're gonna ride all the time now. I'm that that's a that's a new friendship that's really really gonna blossom and I can't wait for him to meet my group that, that we ride with that because uh, I think he's gonna gel well in it. That's awesome. Well just so you know we have a we have a high falls in Center City, Rochester and there you can't solo be but you may be able to to, to give out money to panhandlers or lose a gold chain. But, <laughs> right on. <laughs> there's a little bridge there, there's a little box. <laughs> That's cool. So, as a side note, I will ask you for a uh, picture for my thumbnail. It doesn't have to be the one you showed, just whatever you choose to send. Sure. And then with your consent, I'll, I use it in my thumbnail to advertise the. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, I'll send you the first picture I showed you. <laughs> that will get viral hits, you know? <laughs> I think it will. <laughs> oh, so that leads into it's freaking story time. So obviously, we've only known each other on social media, right? So I don't really have 101 stories to tell. Um, just off the top of the dome, I'm trying to think back on like how I found your how I found your channel and how I found your stuff. So, so Gary, traditionally, I don't watch a lot of stone building stuff because I burn out easy. I'm huge on watching comedians like Theo Vaughn, Bert Kreischer, a uh, couple other like Danny Duncan's people like that, and it keeps me focused on what I want to do in like the stone building world or even just in my YouTube world in general. And uh, so, so however I found you, I, I, I want to say I found you over Instagram, and then and then went to YouTube and then put in your channel. And I, the first the first video I ever seen of yours was Roscoe Beats. Oh, nice! And I'm like, who is this guy running freaking heads of cabbage and lettuce through his tunnel? It was, it was a water, we did a watermelon, a birthday cake. It was Roscoe's birthday. Roscoe is my sled. It's a 2009 600 MXZX, and uh, I've done a lot of mods to it. Tunnel extension and uh, put a 129R motion in it. Tunnel adjusters on it. Um, it's, so it's it's a fun little sled. But I had the track, I had the tunnel back off, and, and I looked at the back, and it was wide open with these studs. These glorious fast track studs sticking out of the track, and I went, I've got an idea. So I bought a birthday cake because it was Roscoe's birthday, and I bought a 
Tim Hortons is big in Canada, so I bought a box of donuts and a four pack of coffee, and then it was October, so I, I went over to the neighbor's house and stole their pumpkins, and we threw the pumpkins, so my son revved the sled up and got the track going, and I just started tossing stuff in there. So, And the last was the big watermelon, which really buckled things up, and I mean, it chewed it up like those fast track studs chewed it up like you wouldn't believe, uh, but the, the Adam Furlong, he said that uh, you could have busted your chain and your, your chain drive chain case with that, uh, with that, because you could tell by the way the track buckled how much stress was on it when the, it was a 20 pound or 24 pound watermelon we tossed in there and it chewed wow. right up. Yeah, I thought that would go viral, but it really has gotten no views. So put those links down in there because that was a great series. Like the, the coffee and donuts is the best. <laughs> So, so then Soulville Sessions, I didn't realize at the time, I watched it one time through, I think, Bobby, and then I found it through you, and then I, after like watching it three or four times, I put it together, I'm like, oh, they're doing, the, they're doing this together, and then of course with Rich, and uh, you had sent me to link the one night, and that's how I kind of linked up with Jesse James, too. Yeah, that, that's uh, right, yeah, yeah. You sent me, and I was like, I was kind of nervous, but I was like, oh, this is cool, and I've suffered since I've been hooked. Yeah. Tuning in on lights and yeah, you know, well, with some of the guys and yeah, it's it's nice and it's, I, I love that like, you see a lot of new names every week come in and but it's it's the core guys that, like yourself when when I see Slow B's name pop up it's like I love it I just and you throw in the chat Slow B you know and it's like you see Pasty Boy come in and. Uh, right. I mean, Blair Morgan pops his head in once in a while in the chat, and you know, like it's it's pretty crazy to think that the the people that come back and and you know follow the, follow along with it. And some of them are in comments after the fact, but the live chat's pretty pretty darn cool. Yeah, I agree. So enough about how I found you and in, in that background. Give it to us, man. What's what's your favorite story? You look, you sit at camp, having a few cocktails. You sit on the podcast, having a few cocktails. What's that story laying on us? Oh, it's it's got to. I, I I bring fannies and the mosey on it to, to it, so you can't use those ones. <laughs> no, but the the Hans and Franz story is is probably the craziest time on snowmobiles that I've ever had, and it, it was. So just going back, there's a place in Gravenhurst, and at the, at the Toronto Snowmobile Show, this little motel had a, had a deal, they were promoting it, that you could actually rent the motel for the season, so from January through March, you could rent this motel for like 600 bucks, let's say, for a two-bedroom unit. And it's one of those no-tell motels, right? They, they usually have hourly rates, but this, this time they're going to sell it to you for 600 bucks. So my buddy, my buddy that I, Grant, that I ride with and his friend Dave, they decided they were going to do this. And it was a, it was a brilliant deal because you just leave your sled there. They had actually a, a, a rack, you, you pull your sled up and then a bar would go through and you'd lock your sled. You'd go home for the week and you could drive up in your wife's compact car you don't need a truck towing every weekend, that kind of thing. And, and like I said, your access to the trails everywhere you go. So very first weekend, we, they go, okay, the trails are open. We're all, we're all going up. So we, we get all the sleds. How are we going to get them up there? This is when everybody had like no access to enclosed trailers or anything like that. And you know, my buddy had a had a F1 uh, a Ford Ranger, sorry, and he had a two place sled trailer that was open on the back. So he said he'd come pick my sled up, at, and he also had to pick my buddy Dino's sled up at Dean's house. So I just had to get my sled to Dean's. So I put it in the backyard of Dean's place for the day. Dean and we, everybody worked the day, and then we're going to leave at night to go. And so my sled's in Dean's backyard. It was a 1980 Yamaha Exciter 440. And the thing was like showroom condition, brand new. 
it was a beautiful sled. The owner that I bought it from never rode it. And so the thing was like showroom condition. So it sat there all day and Dino's got a couple of dogs and they're crazy dogs. So basically after work, I get done work early. I go over to meet Dean at his house and I, I knock on the door and his wife lets me in and she's asked me if I've got a stapler or something. And she's got like a big chunk of foam on the table and vinyl, black vinyl. And I'm going like, what are you doing? And she goes, oh, you need this. And I guess the dogs got crazy and they ate the seat off my sled. They chewed the vinyl right off. So basically she bought the foam and the, and the vinyl and basically grabbed the stapler and we packed the sled up and away we went. And the people that weren't driving had a couple of brown pops on the way up and and by the time we get up there we were, we were feeling no pain and we go into this hotel and it's cold. Like it is, like you said, like it's the minus 30 minus 40 wind chill and it is bloody cold so we get in there and we're recovering the seat on the bed and my buddy grant he's got his george foreman grill in the hotel cooking burgers on electric grill and grease is going up the wall and the doorknob it was so cold the doorknob froze so we had the doorknob apart trying to fix it and Hans, this German guy comes in, which we affectionately called Hans, and he was mad as hell that we had the door apart and shit all over the room. We're cooking in the room, and it was basically, you know, he's like, why are you guys? And my buddy's going, listen, Hans, Hans and Franz, and it was some German-themed restaurant they had there. So basically the guy left all in a huff, and. We thought we were going to take a ride, which none of us had any business at that point in time getting on a machine. And we basically tried to start our sleds, and I think someone was looking down on us because only two of them started, uh, my 440 and, and a buddy's Formula Plus. And the other, my other buddy's sled, every time you hit a bump on the trailer, the suspension went down, but it didn't come up when it was being trailered. So by the time he got down there, it was right on the bottom. So he couldn't ride that. And the other one, it, was, it wouldn't start. It was so bloody cold. So basically the next day, we woke up and it had gotten even colder overnight. None of the plumbing worked. The, the owner was being really obnoxious with us and, you know, wasn't giving anybody an answer. There, there's guys coming in with, with trucks to boost other people to get their vehicles running. And everybody was kind of just leaving. And uh, we were so mad at Hans and Franz that we just basically all went and used the washroom, which you couldn't flush the toilet. So we all took dumps in the toilet and basically left. <laughs> and that was, that was the last time we went in this place. There was a bunch of other stuff happened, but we got to keep it PG, right? <laughs> the, the, first, the first time we went to North Bay, you know, we're walking through the parking lot and you're seeing you're seeing trucks plugged into the wall and stuff and we're like, what the hell's going on? Well well fast forward the next day one of my buddies, we all rode Stadu for the most part, and one of my good friends rode a F seven. And I can remember that we we drug that F seven into the hotel to get it started. Wow. To a, a Best Western we pulled the doors open, we had it in the hallway and once we finally got it started, we got it out of there. <laughs> That's awesome. They must have been really happy with you for that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, they, listen, Gary, they loved us there. Oh, that we went cool. to breakfast. They put us in the dinner, the dinner room, because they didn't want to deal with us. And when we went to dinner, they put us in the breakfast restaurant That's... to keep us away from the general population. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. Would you consider coming up and riding with us if we do a snowmobile sessions group ride? I would love to. I mean. At the end of the day, for me, it bases around the pocket and the uh, work and stuff. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, I talked to I would Pasty. I love to do something like that. I talked to Pasty Boy about it too, and he's interested in coming up. So maybe it's something where you hook up with him and carpool up together. I mean that 
that helps cut the cost a lot if you've got a few guys riding the truck and and four sleds on one trailer right that'll that'll help cut the fuel cost down and, and give you some road stories to tell as well right yeah 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 that would be i'd love I to i'd love that like, yeah i'd love to have you up and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do it this year for sure didn't happen last year but it's gonna happen this year yeah how are things there they uh they let up on you guys yeah oh yeah like, it's pretty much uh COVID's still around and i think it's around in the usa as well but the restrictions are all lifted um i don't know about crossing the border what what's required there yet but um the last video i put up uh this week was showed Corey and i going to a restaurant and we had to get our phones out to show our proof of vaccine well that's all gone now i mean all the masks like it's it's almost back to to normal the way it should be um we're having a real trouble with staffing at restaurants now though that that's been the real issue um, lately really popular places have been closing on weekends because they don't have staff to work at. i don't know where all these people went we're, we're, i'm having the same problem i got to hire two guys for my team and nobody wants to work they don't want to apply for the position or they get offered it and they're like ah, i don't want a full-time job yeah <laughs> i don't want I, I don't know why that is i don't i don't know what happened during the sh during the pandemic that caused people not to want to work you know because it's there was handouts from the government to start but they ended fast and but people still don't want to work i mean i get the restaurant world because if there ever is a shutdown you're you're screwed if you're living off of tips right um right i don't think they would ever shut it down like that again it, i think they realized what kind of a mistake it was but I can't speak for the politicians of, of Canada or Ontario, right? Nor would I want to. <laughs> no. So, but rest assured, it, providing nothing crazy happens, it it should be fairly easy for for you to get across the border. And once you're across the border, it's we're going to have a good time. Right. Been a while, man. I, I remember coming there when I was a kid. And, Drinking triple X beer at 19 years old. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Our drinking age. Yeah, our drinking age is 19, and marijuana is legal if you're into that when you're 18. So, um, it's a, it's a land of plenty. <laughs> Was that place called Sundowners over the border? The, the Sundowner in Niagara Falls. Yeah, yeah. Another another fine establishment. <laughs> I'm not that guy, trust me. No, it's, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so wrapping things up, you got to open floor, man. Tell me, uh, it's kind of your, I call it your love story to snowmobiling, but it doesn't have to be that. Anything you want to talk about, plug your, plug your, plug your uh, podcast, all your social media, what do you want? soul builders and know what don't you want to know whatever you want this is your time your moment yeah okay for sure no like i appreciate you having me on tonight uh to talk about uh, everything and have this great fire now you slacked off on the fire a bit it went out i don't really notice that well to be honest it's burning my back <laughs> i don't know I, I didn't know whether you threw the ballistic beer on it to put it out or, or what happened there but um I thought it was a love letter to snowmobiling. Dear snowmobiling, why do you why do I love you so much and why do you take so much of my money? <laughs> you crazy, you crazy bee. <laughs> but uh, no, it's uh, you can find me on YouTube, uh, Mudbrats, uh, Snowbrats. Uh, if you just search Mudbrats, you'll find it. Uh, Instagram, I I've been playing around with, and I'm really liking that platform. Um, so again, it's Mudbrats underscore Snowbrats and Facebook as well as Mudbrats. If you just search any of those, um, and away we go. So uh, if you subscribe to my channel and you subscribe to my Instagram, uh, I'm running a draw for a uh, uh, you win my brand new mission helmet. And uh, you, you can see details of that on, on my YouTube channel. There'll be more information on that uh when i uh when i as it goes forward but when i hit six thousand subscribers which i think i'm at 5300 right now um 
When I hit 6,000 subscribers, I'm going to do the draw. You have to subscribe to my YouTube. You have to like um, my Instagram or follow me on Instagram. And then basically just sh shoot me your email address to, uh, uh, there's an email on my website, mudbrats.com. Go to mudbrats.com and there's details on there about it. And you can win my mission helmet, never worn. Um, and uh, you can enjoy a great helmet all winter long. And what else? For my soul meal session is coming back. Uh, it's it's coming back Monday, October third, seven p.m. Uh, we're gonna have Jim from the Sportsman Lodge on. Uh, I don't know who my co-host is gonna be yet, but uh, that can be determined, and maybe even Sloby if you want to do it. You know, and and uh, the uh, but yeah, the uh, I'll probably get John Luke from Energy Power Sports to come on and say a few words to kick the season off and and maybe Chris at Fast Track and, and see where we go from there. But Mondays, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and the replays are always available on YouTube or you can uh, go on your favorite podcast platform, uh, whether it be Spotify or Apple Music or Google Podcasts or um, Amazon um, has a podcast network. It's all on there and you can download it and listen to it in your car uh, as time goes on. So yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're over 20,000 downloads and um, I don't know how many people have viewed it on YouTube, but a lot. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Gary, anything for me, man? I, I'll, I'll definitely co-host one for you. Uh, I'm into it. Yeah, for sure. I, I, like you, this is kind of, I started doing these story times and I have a lot of fun doing them, man. Just hearing the different stories and you know the different thought process, of different guys. It's and, and I don't stick. I've done a couple hunting ones, and they're they're just as fun. I, I hunt a little bit, but not as much as I used to. And I want. I'm trying to get my little brother on here to do a fishing one. Nice. And it's just it's just fun to hear the different point of views from people and what they're what makes them what makes them more. You know. Yeah, I, I think what you're doing is really good. I, I like it because it's a, it's a twist on, the, on a traditional podcast or live stream. It's so different than what I do on a, on a weekly basis, and, and it's good. I mean, and, and that's what we need is fresh ideas like, like story time with the boys like this. I, I think it's great. I enjoy watching them, and you, you're using in person, and that's why it took me a bit to... To, to fly down here to see you, but I'm glad you caught the ticket for me and my dog, and and uh, away we go. So it's been great. I'm just glad they like through those customs with these suckers, huh? Mm hmm for sure. Hey, cheers, buddy. Yes, thank you so much, Gary. I really appreciate it. No problem. Um, I gotta get there and ride, you gotta get here and ride. I mean, there's no, there's no question about it, you know? Oh, for sure, we'll, we'll do that, but uh, Definitely thank you very much for having me on. This was a blast. I hope uh, everybody learned something today. And uh, if they didn't, whatever. <laughs> right, right. No, if they, you know, if we got, got one person to be more passionate and all that stuff, you know, I'm all about impacting one person at a time. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And I wore my slow B shorts today, see that? They're my slow B fishing shorts. So I did that for you. <laughs> well, big freaking big billies with it, right? That's right. So, anyway, thank you guys. I really appreciate it, all the comments and and make sure for slow B you subscribe and you hit the like button as well. That helps us and helps YouTube push that video to more people. Yeah, definitely. So, guys, that's a wrap for us, man. Gary, I'm gonna try to pound it. Hey, here, do that again. Hold that fist up again. Here, there. Oh, we did it. Do it again. Do it again. Ready? There. We did it. See, we are sitting. That's episode 12. That's Gary from Mudbrand, Mudbrand, Stonebrand, Stonebill and Sessions. Um, guys, thank you so much for watching and all the support. Thank you for being patient for new content. And this is, this is a highlight of my, uh, it's freaking story time with the boys right now. I got to take my, I, I, I'm telling you, Gary, I got to take you on your snowmobile session. It must have been two years ago now. 
and now I got you on. And we all know I'm not a technical guy, so that's why this works for me. Not talking technical, we just get down into what makes you tick about snowmobiling, and that's what it's awesome that you agreed to do this. Um, it's awesome that you came here. <laughs> yeah, hey, and, when, when you said you were first going to do this last year, and who wants to be on it? You called it out on one of the shows, or on YouTube, or, or Facebook, or Instagram, maybe, and I was like, I want to be on it. Like what? And, and, and then I never got the call, and it's like I want to be on it. But you know, with COVID, you couldn't fly me down. You know, you're out of firewood, and you know now you said you had firewood and free plane tickets. So here I am. So uh, I'm glad. I'm glad I was able to get down here to see it. And I do got to fly home for dinner tonight. So. I, I, I might not get by Pasty Boys out at house after all. Who knows? What's for dinner? Poutine? Yeah. <laughs> poutine, eh? Did I say A at all today? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't notice. I, I don't think I did. If I, if I did, make sure you count, count them up and put them in the comments below. I think I was on my best behavior today. So, so guys, do me a favor, crush that like button, subscribe, do me that other favor, tell your grandmas, your grandpas, your mom, your dads, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, your frenemies, your enemies about these videos. Pass them on. Love you guys. Peace out. We will see you next time. And Gary. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> we'll do it again. I, I appreciate it so much. <laughs> I think you actually hit me in the face there. Awesome. <laughs>